I'm not sure if it's done that before. <laughs> okay, so hello everybody and welcome to the June 2021 edition of Fiction Fixed Online. This event is being live streamed to the Finger on the Pulse, which is the Facebook group from Fiction Fix Online. And the Zoom video will be posted afterwards on my Helen Claire Gould's channel on, the, on YouTube. So please do subscribe and point all your friends towards it. And if you wish to join the Finger on the Pulse, please uh, request to do so. There are a few rules to review and some questions to answer, but the group is for both readers and listeners. At our Fiction Fix live events, there's always a books table. We can't do that with Fiction Fix online, but authors, please post your book details in the chat, okay? If you have a website, sorry, teeth won't work. If you have a website, in, indeed, do include it and a link to the ebook or seller for the print version. Um, and uh, prices would be helpful and an ISBN or ASIN if you have it. On Amazon Kindle, the ASIN will take readers straight to the book. This can be done at the end or any time during the show while you're not reading. And I will post it with the live stream and the video uh, or in the comments below it. So now Colin is going to start this afternoon's fun by bringing us up to speed with the next instalment of his ongoing fantasy series. So please show your appreciation for Colin, A. Brett and Milo. Yay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, at the end of the last little episode, um, the crowd of uh, villagers and travellers in the inn had said they were going to start gaming, dicing games. Yes. And Milo B in the village dog's body uh, got charged with setting up the tables. So we pick up from there. Four tables were arranged in a square and stout boards placed around the edges to prevent the dice bouncing onto the floor. Wages were laid on a side table, jealously guarded by the boss, innkeeper, sometime impartial referee, ex-thief and occasional mentor to Milo. His name was Davide, Davidov Germes. The game had lasted an hour. Now only three players remained. A villager named Hetzer, a merchant Jeff Rebeck of Ima, who had arrived with the battle-scarred caravan, and Milo, the, vin the inn's errand boy and servant. Milo had won a few rounds and built up his funds from a few coppers to several silvers. He couldn't match the gold coins he had seen Rebeck throw into the pot, but the boy knew Hetzer was onto his last few pennies, and the village's laziest carpenter wouldn't last the next round. He was right. Hetzer rolled snake eyes and stormed out of the inn to the howls of laughter from the assembled as Germes greedily counted the loser's coins. Well, gents, the innkeeper said to the remaining players, shall we play one last round? Winner takes all. Lester Kurt, the boss takes, yelled some wag from the crowd. Germes feigned wounded pride. I'll have you know, Mac Taft, I only take what's due to the house. The ex-thief lowered his voice, but still everyone could hear plus an extra 10%. More uproarious laughter followed this comment. Gentlemen, said the thief. Rebeck looked at the pile of coins on the table. For these villagers, such a sum would be almost princely. Certainly it would take the work of several years to amass so much money. For him, though, the money was not important. He was playing against the upstart boy brat who he had seen romancing young Callie, a fine girl with a good and rich family. She was even clinging to the boy's arm as the commoner fought, fought over his choice. The boy should be taught a lesson not to go over his station. I will take that challenge, said the merchant. Boy? Milo counted the coins in his hand and looked at the pile on the boss's table. Even less Germay's cut, that money would set Milo on a different path, one which would take, it, would take him away from Hessard's ford. All right, boss. Lay your stakes then. Milo placed the last of his coins on the table. Rebeck matched it with two Imerian gold crowns, raising a gas from the crowd. The dice were pot tossed. Milo made a spirited throw, the bone cu carved cubes bouncing and clattering across the table. His throw was good, but not unbeatable. 
Milo watched intently as Rebecca took up the dice and cast a critical eye across the table. He could see where the joined tables were scratched and pitted, each blemish on the surface making the fall of the dice riskier. Rebecca could only beat the boy's throw on a good table and beat with a practice flick of the wrist, but not here. I've played on better, smoother tables, landlord, the merchant said. It's been a fair old game so far, sir, replied the innkeeper. If you don't like the table, you can forfeit to the boy and cut your losses. Rebeck smiled as two dice fell gently from the cuff of his jacket into the palm of his hand. He used the momentary distraction to employ his own dice. You are right, of course, landlord. He tossed the dice and they came up doubles. Rebeck had won. The crowd erupted into a storm of laughter, claps and cheers. Milo's heart sank into his boots. His dreams of life away from Hessard's Ford evaporated. Even the warmth of Callie's hand as she gripped his arm tightly meant little to him as he realised the truth. Rebeck had won. Double or quits? Callie's high, clear voice rang out over the tumult of the crowd. What? the boss shouted. Double or quits? Callie repeated firmly as the crowd became subdued. Common gambling like this is beneath the man of your station, Mr. Rebeck, and the law and knows it's beneath mine too. But I know the rules. I watched our men playing these dice games around our campfire. She paused as looks of guilt seeped over the faces of the Imerians. I saw one man win back all his losses with this stupid rule. But I have nothing to double, Callie, Milo protested. Mr. Rebeck, Rebeck cleaned me out. His eyes widened and watched Callie remove a ring from her right little finger. She held it up, set with two sapphires, and each as blue as her eyes. Pure Imerian silver, she said, and set with sapphires from south of the Sea of Rin. I shall loan this to you, Milo, to play double or quits against Mr. Rebeck. You can't do that, Callie, her father roared from behind her. That ring is priceless, girl. Think of what you're doing. I have thought, father, Callie replied. This ring is mine. I bargained for it and bought it at an extremely good price. You know I did because you were there when I was nine years old. And you still remember the look of defeat on the jeweler's face when I bargained his price down. The girl paused and watched her father's face change from clouded anger to pride in his daughter. I know the law as it stands in our land. This ring is mine and I can do with it whatever I please. Milo looked from the ring to Callie's eyes. And what if I lose? What do I lose then? It's not as if I have anything else to trade. If the ring goes, everything goes. Callie straightened. Then you lose your freedom, Milo. You will take a year of indentured service to me and my family. That is the law of our land, if not yours, for those who default on debts. She dropped the ring into Milo's open palm. Win it back for me, Milo, she whispered. Rebecca looked at the ring and his mouth was suddenly dry. It was a thing of beauty which would have fitted the younger Callie's index finger when she was nine and now perfectly fit her little finger. He realised he had that nothing he had would exceed the value of the ring. Rebecca reached for his dice. You first, sir, Milo said with a confidence he did not feel. Rebeck tossed the dice. On a normal flat table, his loaded dice would have come up doubles, but as one landed true, the second bounced out of a knife cut on the surface and turned up a one. His score was still fair, however, and would take some luck for the boy to beat. May I? Milo borrowed the accent and manners of Callie as he tried to as he asked to use Mr. Rebeck's dice for his throw. He saw Rebeck flinch nervously and knew the man had cheated in the last round. Only Cack. Callie's recklessness had given him a chance to beat this cheat. Rebeck saw he was trapped. He could not refuse the boy at this point. To do so would arouse suspicion and perhaps even inspection of his loaded dice. If that happened, he would surely be caught. He handed the cube to the, poor, to the boy. Milo weighed his di the dice in his right hand and tossed them deftly to his left. As they clicked together, he knew. One of the dice was weighted on one face. That was enough. He cast his gaze over the table, spotted the bumps and grooves he wanted with the correct speed and spin. Callie held her breath. She liked Milo. She really did. But she knew that what she had done, while legal in her own country, was almost unconscionably stupid. If he lost his throw, her most prized possession would fall into Rebecca's slimy fingers and with it her pride and her father's respect. She closed her eyes as Milo flicked his wrist and sent the dice tumbling across the table. The dice ricocheted around the table, bouncing off the sides and off the grooves Milo had aimed at. 
Double sixes landed face up. The winner, roared the bros, and the crowd broke into thunderous applause. And thank you. Can you unmute, please? Woo. Thank you. Thank you all. Good job. That was Thank awesome. <laughs> yeah. Hello. It's Thank my you. friend Lynn just joining us. Hello, Linda. Lynn? Lynn? Lynn. Lynn. Yeah, sorry, I'm a late. Lynn. No, sorry, I'm a little bit late. Fine, don't worry. <laughs> I've got um, a rubbish shot and I thought, oh, it's gone four o'clock. Yeah. Like um, you do. Yeah, as you do. Right. So, yeah. um, now, can, I just need to tell you that Colin organises the technical side of this live stream. So he deals with OBS Studio and the stream into Facebook. So many thanks to him for that. And let's please give it up for Colin, A. Brett and Milo. Unmute Hi, everybody. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, so today... We should have three new readers for you and one returning reader. One of them uh, at the moment isn't here, so I'm slightly concerned about that, but you know, we obviously have a schedule to keep to. So our next reader this afternoon is Mike, otherwise known as MK Whiting, who is our today's international guest author. And he has several books upcoming, of which this is one. And today he's going to read from a near future SF story. So will you please give a warm welcome to Mike, sorry, MK Whiting with his novel, Hitching a Ride. Mark and Steve, can you unmute? Thank you. Right. All right. This is from chapter one of a book that I have. It's, it's being edited right now called Hitching a Ride, Thumbs Up. Um, but I had to modify the chapter one slightly to fit the 10 minute window. So there are some parts that may seem a little choppy, but the, the, I wanted to make sure we got to the end of the chapter. Yeah. So here we go. Hitchhiker, present day. What were you hoping for, William? Headlines such as Dragon 2 and Falcon 1 explode on a launch pad? Flight director George Sullivan responds to Special Agent William Snare's request to delay the launch. Well, that's not going to happen on my watch. I have a feeling that the launch of Dragon 2 is a target for sabotage. I would strongly suggest we delay the launch until we can ensure that it will be safe, William blurted out to George as they walked to the press conference. We have never had anyone try to sabotage a launch, William. Now you're asking me to scrub this launch? until you can get more information and it's just a feeling, we will launch on schedule no matter what. End of discussion. George, just give me a day or so to better understand this threat, pleaded William. I've made my decision on this matter. It's final. William, just let it go. At this point, you have no facts. I am late for the final press conference. We will not talk of this any longer. Agent Snare had been tracking a possible threat for several months now. But each time he feels he's on the right path, the facts just do not add up. His gut tells him something will happen during this mission, but he can't pin it down. Commander, you are go for launch. Godspeed to you all, Mission Director George Sullivan shared with the crew. The launch was a total success. All systems worked as planned. 24 hours later, the Dragon 2 was on approach to the ISS station, getting ready to dock. Agent Snare felt a little more relieved that his gut turned out to be nothing. As much as he wanted to be correct, he was glad that he was not. The actual docking process is filmed and broadcast back to the earth for the public to watch. From an untrained eye, the process seems slow and straightforward. But what is not well known to the public, yet not a secret, is that the ISS is traveling at 17,000 miles per hour, and Dragon 2 must catch up match their speed precisely while aligning their orbit correctly. At that speed, just being off one degree or one mile per hour would force them to consume fuel they would need for re-entry. So the approach is a slow and precise activity to avoid even being off by any margin at all. The crew met up with the International Space Station's current resident and were greeted welcomely with open arms. The current resident is a Japanese doctor 
named Norish Kanai. He has been on the ISS for about three months. He was glad to see others after his solo stay. This stay on the station was not Norish's first time living on the ISS. He was a resident in 2017-2018 for 168 days. He is going to remain on the station after the crew of Dragon 2 departs. He is researching various chemicals and how they react to being in space for long periods. Norish, it is good to see you again. We hope you're enjoying your second stay on board the station, greeted Commander Michael Holliday. It is nice to see a familiar face after a few months up here alone. How have you and Jenny been doing, Mike? It's been a long while since we've been together, asked Norish. We have been good. It was a scary time back in 2020, but everybody came through it and remained healthy. Let me introduce my crew. This is Captain Kenneth Walt, our pilot for this mission, Lieutenant Maria Gonzalez, our communications officer, and mission specialist, William Gamble. Welcome to your new home for the next few weeks. I'm pleased to meet you all. You probably know the station from all the studying you've done, but seeing the real thing is so much better than a book. Commander Holliday, you are go for your final spacewalk. Mission Control has given the green light. You and Mission Specialist Gamble need to be suited up, said Communications Officer Maria Gonzalez. How is Bill holding up? This will be his first spacewalk, and we'll be inspecting a large portion of this station. We'll be out there for a while. He won't give away that he is nervous to anyone, but his eyes say it all, explained Marie. Commander Holliday on the intercom. Bill, let's get suited up for your first spacewalk. I'll meet you at the Quest airlock in 30 minutes. Bill, you take the lead and I will follow just like we've trained for the last six months. The two exited the Quest airlock and attached themselves via a tether to the ISS framework. The purpose of the spacewalk is to inspect the solar arrays and document any damage that they might find. The mission specialists would keep a visual and audio record of the inspection and they would forward the results to mission control later. They both had tethers connecting themselves to the station, but they also had a safer unit attached, also known as a simplified aid or EVA rescue. It is essentially a tiny jetpack that will help them if they get separated from the station. It is something used on every EVA because it will keep the astronauts safe. Looking around, Bill cannot get over the freedom he felt. Open space, an unobstructed view of the Earth, floating weightless in space with this kind of view was life-altering. Commander, do you ever lose a feeling of awe, asked Bill? No, each time it is special. And I never forget the fact we are a select few that have this opportunity, but nothing can beat the first time. The mixture of fear, excitement, awe, all rolled into one moment, shared Mike. Marie breaks in. Sorry to interrupt your sightseeing tour and special moment, Bill. Commander, we're picking up some space debris getting close to our position. We'll keep, you, keep an eye on it in case it gets too close. It is currently in a higher orbit and as such, it is tracking faster than we are, but be on alert. Space junk. You'd think this would be the one place we would not find any garbage, said Bill. Okay, Bill, lead the way to panel array 14 and we can start our inspections there. I will take over the sightseeing while you focus on the mission, shared Mike. Only one more array to inspect, and then we'll have officially ended this spacewalk. Marie, what's the status of the space junk? It is getting closer. It is still in a higher orbit, but it has decayed slightly as we've been monitoring it. If you look back towards array 10 from your current position, that is where it is coming from, explained Marie. Roger that. We will finish our inspections and begin our trip back to the Quest airlock. Bill, sorry to say, we only have a few more minutes out here. Finish your inspections and take your last look around. Commander, be on alert. The debris has changed trajectory and is split into two pieces, and one of them is now on an intercept course with the station. Marie added urgently. How can space debris change course and split up, asked Bill. Bill, time to head back to the airlock. Marie, what is the distance to the station at this point in the ETA? A thousand meters and sl closing slowly. ETA is about two minutes. However, it appears to be slowing. Do you have a visual? We are looking, nothing yet. We're almost to the airlock. Marie, notify Mission Control that we have inbound debris and that we'll keep them informed. 
Commander, I think I see the debris or something coming towards us. It seems to have a light source and it's moving in our direction, shared Bill. Yes, I see it. Marie, what is the ETA now? Asked Mike. Commander, it has slowed its approach and is now coming straight at your location at a reduced velocity, ETA 30 seconds. It looks like a person. That's not possible, but that is what I'm seeing, explained Bill. Cut the chatter, Bill. Open the airlock, secure yourself inside, commanded Mike. It does appear to be a person of unknown origin. They're slowing down and waving to us. I think I recognize the spacesuit. It looks like an older Orlin, Mike shared inquisitively. Marie, are you picking up any radio traffic locally? Nothing, Commander. We're not receiving any signal in this area. They are now 30 meters away and stopped. And they're giving the thumbs up sign. I think they're putting their thumb at the earth, Mike, at, Mike said. Do they want a ride, asked Bill. That appears to be indication. I'm going to try to get them to come inside the airlock. Dr. Kanai, prepare the med bay in case we need medical attention. Lieutenant Gonzalez, report that debris did not impact the station. No other communications with mission control. We need to follow quarantine protocol. Everyone hazmat suits on and get ready for a visitor. The visitor followed Commander Holliday into the Quest airlock. Usually there is room for two people in the outer airlock, so three was tight. As soon as the mission specialist shut the airlock door, he and the commander did their normal post-EVA processes. They backed up to the rack to remove their safer unit. Everyone in the space station is waiting for the visitor to remove their helmet and explain where they came from, how they ended up in space. The process to remove the spacesuits was a lengthy one. All three of them moved into the suit compartment and removed their helmets first. Commander Holliday and Mission Specialist Gamble stayed as far away as they could from the visitor. The visitor was the first to speak. Hi, my name is Andrew. You must be Commander Holliday and you are Mission Specialist Gamble, correct? Who are you and what are you doing out there? Asked Commander Holliday while pointing outside to the airlock. Commander, that's an excellent question and straight to the point. As much as I am a shock to you, being here is an even greater shock to me, added Andrew. The commander watched the visitor, Andrew, as he connected his suit to purge the moisture and release the pressure. Andrew seemed to know what he was doing and exactly where to hook up and place his suit. When the three finished assisting each other and removing their and purging their suits, they exited the suit room and entered the ISS. Commander, Mission Control wants to know why the radio silence, exclaimed Marie, as she looked at their guest inquisitively. They can wait. Maintain radio, radio silence. For now, let's find out who, what, where, and why you are here, Andrew, added the commander. The commander was first to voice the obvious. You can't be more than 15 or 16 years old. What is a boy doing up here? Is that... Ooh. Right. Okay, so um, thank you so much. Please yeah. do put your hands together for Mike waiting. Thank you. And hitching a ride. That was fab. I, I, I thought everybody seemed to be really absolutely wrapped in that. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not a good reader, but I think the story is going to fit nicely. Yeah. No, it sounded really good. So now we welcome one of our new readers who is also a debut author. So let me introduce you to Sharon Ihama and uh, her fantasy novel, which is part of a series and it's called The Emerald Stone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, please don't feel obliged. I mean, um, to, to clap if you, if you don't want to. I mean, my fa my mm. family and friends have been very supportive with the um, you know, with the marketing campaign since the release. So I did. I wanted to give them a break, you know, because they work full time, and you know, I just didn't want to be. I wanted to be considerate in, in in allowing them enjoy their weekend. So please don't feel obliged to, to clap if you don't want to. That's fine. Don't worry. But you know, congratulations to all the authors. Quickly, congratulations to all the authors. And I mean, that's amazing. You know, obviously we, the journey of being published is a, is a long and an arduous and difficult road. So to be You're right about that. Achievement, you know, so well done to all, to all the authors, first of all. And uh, thank you, Helen, for the introduction. I'm going to be a little bit old fashioned with the reading, uh, you know, reading a physical book, you know, rather than reading on screen, because it, oh. it's just the way that I, you know, I, I should have done that, the ebook format, but I, that didn't occur to my mind, so. I'll just read from the from the book. 
yeah, that's okay. Hopefully you can still see, I'll try to keep be engaged with the screen as well. Okay, so the first chapter, um, on an unexpected visit. To 17-year-old Mark Morley, this was a stock you really only read about in books or watched in movies like The Lord of the Rings. This was not the sort of stuff that actually happened in real life, at least not to him. Those kind of inexplicable and uncanny things, if they ever did happen, and that was a very big if, lived somewhere far off, somewhere invisible, concealed and bordering Earth's edge, wherever Earth's edge was. The abode where these kinds of things happened never seemed to cross its boundary and never collided with ours. But all the while, it had been hovering invisibly, waiting, waiting, and waiting until now. Mark had just one ambition after he finished Raymond's secondary school. He wanted to be a pilot. He wanted to fly around the globe, and this ambition did not stretch much further than that. It wasn't that Mark particularly liked the idea of flying itself or that there was no other career opportunity open to him. So he was very aware that his options were limited. Life had dealt him an unfortunate hand and the thought of flying was the only way that he felt he could survive living. <coughs> Excuse me. Flying offered him the possibility of escape where his five attempts at suicide had failed, giving him the impression that even death itself mocked him. He dreaded foster homes and had been cautioned by a social worker that he would be sent to one if he should attempt suicide again. It was the idea of becoming a pilot that had offered him, and that had offered any glimmer of hope. And that strange glimmer of hope seemed to promise a chance of adventure, a way to cope with the dark thoughts that haunted him continually. And, a way to mask the pain that most people didn't see, but the pain was deep. He had seen a TV commercial featuring a daydreaming boy whose fantasies of adventures in mystical terrains had led him to pursue a career in aviation. The idea had struck him like a sharp thrust of light, and his life, though hard, seemed less woeful. He imagined himself exploring other worlds where imagination alone was not enough. He imagined exploring remote and distant worlds untrodden and steeped in pools of mystery where one didn't quite know what they would find out. He could never have imagined the path that would stretch open before him when he got that college, college scholarship. A scholarship he was not expecting at all. A scholarship that would take him on an adventure that he would never ever forget. It was not that Mark Morley was a dull student, but neither was he exceptionally bright. He was an average schoolboy, bullied and an orphan. Living in flat 18 Thunderbell, Thunderbell Street, a grey, dismal and rugged part of North London, his, parent, his parents, Robert and Camille, had been childless for many years. They were not the superstitious kind. A strange encounter happened one normal, unsuspecting humdrum day. If people would pay closer attention in their busy lives, scurrying about, darting here and there like headless chickens, perhaps mm -hmm. some things could be discerned. An old woman said to Camille while she was grocery shopping that day. Her name was Mona. She had an unusual voice, voice, and her face beamed a radiant smile as she spoke. Oh, thank you, Camille replied embarrassingly, as the old woman appeared behind her, stretching towards her two cucumbers that had fallen from her hand. Her steps were nimble for someone of her age, whatever her age was. At least it wasn't eggs, the old woman chuckled. I remember what happened to me once, or maybe twice. A crate of six eggs it was. All six of them shattered all over the floor, she continued, shaking her head and tottering as she spoke. What a nightmare, Camille said, as she scanned her creased food, food list to see what the items were left to get. And she was in a hurry to get them. Mona continued, unperturbed. It was, until it taught me something I've never forgotten since. She paused for a bit as her gaze slid down Carmel's face till it came to a halt around her abdomen. Sure, the eggs were cracked, she continued softly. She paused for a scant moment, clasping her hands. 
believe me when I tell you I bought eggs that had absolutely nothing in them, completely empty shells, she exclaimed. But when I saw those shell fragments floating over their yolks, I knew it was a sign, like an omen, you could say. She looked thoughtfully at Camille. Shrouded in the darkness of an egg, egg carton, hope lives. She nodded with an expression that said more than it willed to give away. Camille glanced at an item on her shopping list before giving Mona an awkward stare. How strangely she spoke, as though she possessed unseen powers of some kind or knew where those powers lived. Then her attention returned to her shopping food list and impatient to be on her way, she eyed the woman with mild annoyance as she stuffed the shopping list inside her coat pocket. It had been a busy and tiring day at her hairdressing job and all Camille longed to do was to get the rest of the shopping, which the teal pay for the items and leave the store. She was very hungry and not in the mood for pleasantries of any kind at that time of the mid evening. As Mona was about to continue, Camille thumped a bag of potatoes into her basket and darted forward, signaling her desire for the unwelcome banter to end. But the old woman's gaze fell on Camille's abdomen again. Camille had noticed, but with tiredness and hunger beating inside her, she gave the gesture no further thought. Mona's voice became low toned. So for a time, it sits in the darkness of a carton. How nice it is to find that the eggs were not empty. Her lips curved upwards as she said the words. The shop floor was a gooey mess, but I dare say a few spectators seemed more impressed with my sense of balance than impatience to maneuver past me. She stared distantly as though amusing the scene. Camille's patience had grown thin by that point. She grabbed the shopping basket and was about to walk away when suddenly she stopped. It had struck her. Mona had been staring at her stomach area for a good while. Camille's heart jumped. Who was this woman and what business had she with her? Why had her strange gaze been fixed on her like she knew something that Camille herself didn't? Before Camille could find any response to the woman's uncomfortable stare, the woman stepped away from her and said, I trust you'll have a pleasant evening. And without another word, she ambled down the aisle towards the building crowd of shoppers, her long navy blue tweed, tweed coat trailing behind her, making her appear even more mysterious than before. Camille stood still and stiff, staring, aghast, as the woman walked on. A chill ran down her spine. She peered down at the shopping basket, and without a second thought, she dropped it on the floor by one of the shelves and briskly walked out of the store. Her hunger had, com had completely disappeared. As she walked out, as she walked out, she wrapped her arms over her abdomen as if protecting something delicate or as if she could still feel the woman's piercing gaze scanning her body. She turned to look behind her several times as she hurried home, as though she might suddenly reappear out of the chill air. She arrived at the, their small flat, still shaken by the encounter, Robert snores audible as she entered, and too terrified she couldn't wait till dawn to tell him. She told him that night. Robert was puzzled on hearing the bizarre accounts, but all he was able to suggest was for them to wait and see what would come of it or what would happen next. Though Robert didn't think much of though Robert didn't think much about obscure or superstitious things, he usually classed them as a stroke of coincidence. There was a slither of something somewhere inside him when it came to old silver-haired folk, folk, or as he called them. He felt there was more to their grey hair than met the eye. I try not to mess with the oldies, he'd say. There's something about those shimmery greys on their heads. So, on that cold autumn night when Camille was aroused from sleep by an uncomfortable tingling sensation in her ab abdomen, she was very fearful and she talked at Robert. I'm scared that something, something doesn't feel right. I want to go for a checkup in the morning. In the morning, she said. Never had they expected that the discomfort Camille had felt would signal new life being spawned inside her, the signs of life they had hoped and prayed for all those long years. On the 5th of October, on a very cold but sunny day, Mark Morley built it into the world, and his parents had little doubt that the, that the old woman's egg Edom had referenced this glorious event. As they cradled him and rubbed his chubby cheeks, brown cheeks, they couldn't help thinking what kind of life lay ahead of him. They hoped, at least, 
that it would be one with more promise and less struggle than they, they themselves had known. Mark could not have arrived in their lives at worse a time. Though both parents were overjoyed at their little bundle of joy, their financial struggle was grim. It was the worst it had ever been. Boss cars where Robert worked had undergone a restructure that meant taking a substantial salary cut and a reduction in his working hours. Unable to secure a full-time post quickly enough, he took a second job just so the family could get by. Robert and Camille had lived in their small London apartment for seven years. It was on the steep side of Thunderbell Street. They relocated from green and leafy Lincolnshire to the city of London, where they attempted to track their luck in seeking better work prospects than they had back in the world. Born and bred in Lincolnshire, not, not, Nottingham, Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, Robert had managed to secure work at Boscart and they had set packing. Robert was an extremely industrious man, determining to do more with his life than had been handed to him. Emil was a creative Jamaican-born seamstress who saw the city as an auspicious place to start a business in fashion. They had both hoped with excitement at the opportunities that living in the city would open to them. They didn't have very much, but what they could manage, they gathered together to make their dream of owning a business of their own become a reality. They worked tirelessly, hoping that the fruit of their labour would, in time, become visible, but it hadn't come to pass as they had planned or expected. Constraints in the UK economy and a brutal recession shook at the foundation of their dream, as many of their clients withdrew under the austerity measures of the uncertain future. Finally, and in painful reluctance, they abandoned their dream, and Robert continued at Oscar, and Camille took work as a hairdresser. The future in the city looked bleak, and it wasn't gleaming with the golden opportunities that they had hoped for. With Mark's arrival in their lives, the passing weeks and months continued to prove financially wearisome. But despite the struggle, their newly found source of joy, snugly wrapped in, in a bundle of blankets, was a constant reminder of how terribly dismal their lives would have been if that one wish of having a child of their own had not happened. So they promised each other and they promised, promised little Mark that with every morsel of strength that they could both garner, they would do whatever it took to carve him a decent future, one that they were unable to, unable to afford for themselves. I think that's 10 minutes or 12 minutes already, I think. That's fine. That's okay. That's fine. Okay, that's unmute everybody and clap like Julio. Let's mm. hear it again for... Um, and the Emerald Stone. There we go. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next up is Carol, Carol Kerry Green, who returns with her debut novel, A Paranormal Tale. And Carol's book came out in April, but unfortunately my accident delayed her return to fiction picks at that <laughs> point. Um, so she last read in February. And now, I would just like to say, you know, this is, it's great to have debut authors on, um, but it's also good to use this as a, a way of advanced publicity for your novel, you know, or your <coughs> collection of short stories or whatever, because, you know, you are building up the, the words, um, the uh, awareness of it uh, in advance. So could you please make some noise for Carol Kerry Green reading from her novel of Blood and Shadows. Ooh. Thank you everyone. Right, um, I'm going to sort of be reading from the uh, paperback version, which uh, since I just happen to have it here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is a um, bit more of an action scene, so we'll see how it goes. Dastan rushed down the stairs after Rupert, just catching up with him at the bottom. Putting his hand out onto his shoulder, he found himself being roughly thrown against the wall with Rupert's right arm across his neck. Rupert, stop, think, he gasped. They could, Striger. Rupert loosened his hold on Dastan. I'm not crazy. I know, Dastan leant down and put his hands on his knees, catching his breath. Look, I know we haven't always got on, but still, I didn't want you yeah, didn't want you rushing out into a trap. Rupert sneered at Dastan and pulled out his iPad from his jacket pocket. He showed him the view from outside of the back door. There was no one there. Cautiously, they opened the back door and stepped out into the car park. There was no movement anywhere. 
I've already sent the signal to the other shops to close up and retreat to their safe rooms, Rupert said, as he showed Dastan a view from the front of the parade of shops. Metal shutters were already coming down on all of them. Listen. A mechanical voice came over the speaker. Be aware, be aware. This parade of shops is closed. This is due to a gas leak. The correct authorities have been informed and the leak is being dealt with. The shops will be reopened as soon as they can. Dastan watched as a few people who had been milling around the front of the store shrugged and left the area. Rupert changed the view on the screen to the inside of the surf shop. They couldn't see if there were any Striga, but it didn't mean they weren't there. They could just make out Bill's body lying on the floor near the till. Reaching, inside, reaching into the inside of his jacket once more, Rupert pulled out a sharpened wooden stake and held it in his right hand. Dastin nodded at him and reaching down to his ankle, pulled out the dagger that he kept in a sheath there. He'd never been Rupert's biggest fan. He hated his old English gentleman persona and was aware that he and Cornelius had once had an affair back in the day, which Cornelius assured him had been casual, at least on his side. Years later, he'd confessed to Dastan that he hadn't been aware that Rupert's house had been involved. Dastan knew Rupert still carried a torch for Cornelius, even after all these years. They waited at the door, trying to sense anything out of the ordinary. There was nothing to give them any clues as to what was happening inside. The place was completely silent. Rupert nodded and Dastan crouched down as the door opened, as if they'd been doing this for years. They moved in unison through the door, Rupert going high and Dastan low, sweeping the inside of the shop for any movement. Slowly they made their way through the staff room at the rear of the shop. Rupert peeled off to check the storeroom as Dastan continued to check out the shop itself. Suddenly he felt a weight land on his body and felt something scratching at his neck. Throwing his weight to one side, he was able to dislodge the striga which had obviously been waiting for them and had dropped from the ceiling when Dastan walked by. Come into the parlour, said the spider to the fly, the striga said in a sing-song voice as he came in close again for an attack. Dastan fainted right and managed to shrug the striga off. It landed on its back amongst a, a rack of wetsuits for hire. Before he could move further, though, Rupert was there with the stake and plunged it deep into the striga's heart. Thanks, Dastan whispered. He touched his hand to his neck and his fingers came away bloody. It didn't feel too bad, but he'd check later for infection. Astriga's fingernails were never clean. They nodded at each other and continued to search the shop, making sure they looked upwards at the rows of surfboards hanging from the ceiling and the racks and racks of wetsuits. Just as they searched the end of the shop, another Striga leapt out at them. A Donati and a vamp, how cute, he said, pulling a knife from his back. His grin showed off his blood-encrusted teeth. Just Dastan tried not to think about it being Bill's blood. Rupert attacked, his body whirling round and round the striga. Dastan watched Rupert's back, preparing to step in if need be. It was over quickly as Rupert stabbed the second striga through the heart with his stake. They spent the next few minutes searching the shop, top to bottom but the two Striga appeared to be the only ones there. When they were sure it was clear, Rupert sent the all-clear signal to the other shops and told the employees to go home for the rest of the day. He also contacted Liatius to update him and advised that though he was pretty sure there weren't any other Striga hanging about, a quick check of the other shops was probably in order before they reopened for the next day. Liatius agreed. He had called in several more vampires and humans from their coven and they were waiting out the back for them. Dastan knelt down by Bill's body. He had hardly said a word to him at breakfast, but he felt saddened by his death. He thought of Jack and hoped he'd survive his rebirth, knowing that ev not every change was successful. We'll arrange to burn his body and that of the street, get Rupert said, as he knelt down next to Dastan and sighed. He was a good man, such a waste. They opened the back door to the surf shop and several people from Liege's coven were in the car park with a large van. They would load the bodies into it and dispose of them after dark. Most of those present were either human 
or older vamps like Rupert who could survive in the sun's rays for several hours. Daston had just finished talking to Cornelius on his cell phone as Rupert opened the door to Leatrice's apartment and motioned Daston through. He felt like a sort of truce had been called between them as they ascended the stairs to report back to the others. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much then, Carol. So let's hear it again for Carol Kerry Green and of Blood and Shadows. Okay, now our final new reader of the day, Richie Billing, has not come to the meeting. Now, I don't know what's happened because obviously there's a cutoff point beyond which I can't actually be on the computer and checking for messages and things. So I presume something's happened. We'll try and include him in a future um, fiction fix online, but um, we probably need to move on. So um, I'm going to close the session for now with a reading from um, the Zardoth Imperative Clanship, which you may see I've had included to my my name here and I, I thought oh I don't know if it's going to all fit in so I'll just put TZI planship. Okie doke so here we go. Um, right so um, this is, I read a, a piece from chapter six last time I'm going to carry on from chapter six. Um, this time though we're in the control room of the Challenger 2 outside the declining system. Oh, hang on a minute, let me just let um, Charles in. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Hello, Charles, Chuck. Hey. hey. Hi, Chuck. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah. I'm doing well. Great. Unfortunately, we've um, not uh, one of our readers has not turned up, but um, we'll try and include him again later. Okay, so this is from the control room of the Challenger 2 outside the Declaney system. Red Hempel strode up and down her control room. It's a perfectly natural mistake to have made, she told herself, in the circumstances. That Zardothi ship just appeared out of nowhere. Olga Varishkova's curt laser comms message had brought her up short just when she'd been anticipating a successful mission without even having to go all the way to declaim. You're recalled, she told Olga. Words followed in a different language. Spoken in a man's voice, it took a second for the translation to follow. Just one thousandth, Commander. Your troops are detained on my ship. Outrageous, she fumed. How dare you? How dared you send troops to occupy my ship, retorted the Zardothi commander. My standing orders are to recapture the Bakel and take the children into custody. I shall do whatever <coughs> I can necessary to execute those orders. Well, firstly, you would then be transgressing onto territories we've given oath to free from the Vol. And secondly, you'd be committing acts of violence against a Zardothi ship and its officers. Is your world hell-bent on causing a war between our two peoples? Because I can assure you that retribution would be swift and unrelenting. He paused, especially in view of the apparent use you've made of the Bakel while the children were growing up. We did have permission to copy the ship and the weapons, Red Hempel said indignantly. From I.R. de Kutz. Olga wasn't going to mention that IR had only made that decision long after the Bakel had been partly dismantled by Eddie Harkness and his team. IR should know we would never share our technology with you. Nevertheless, he did share it on the basis that the Voth would be on their way to us when they'd finished with Declaim. Ah. The Zardothi commander was silent for a moment or two, perhaps considering his options. I still think you owe us an apology at the very least. Look, anyone can make a mistake. Red Hempel had directed her anger against herself earlier. Now she was angry with the Zardothi commander. I'm sorry that we mistook you for the Bakel, all right? It was a genuine mistake, I assure you. She drew in a deep breath. Now, would you please release my Marines? You'll have to excuse me for a thousand. 
and now we go to the Bikel, uh, Shuttle One, which is um, heading down to land on Declaim. The shuttle swooped over the night shadowed dunes following Mill's coordinates for the city. Hardy Brencher watched as the altimeter level dropped. The, the view of the city grew in his sim tank and the light waxed outside as the shuttle entered the daybreak zone. It had proved surprisingly easy to fly the craft, even though his practice flight had been in space, while this mission was tempered by the gravity and atmosphere of a planet. Hardy had been surprised to learn of another benefit of his translator implant. You can use it to control a clanship or a shuttle, I.R. had told him. You didn't tell me about that. You didn't ask, I.R. had retorted, but I figured that now was when you needed to know. So if we hadn't needed to do this, I'd never have found out. Hardy had shot him a glance through narrowed eyes, but I.R.'s face was expressionless. Just get onto the pilot's couch, pull down the headset, and think of the coordinates you want. The nav gear yeah. does the rest, but unless you have the implant, you'll need to control it manually, and there isn't time to teach you that now. Yeah. Hardy checked the instrument readouts again. He didn't like the look of one of them, and as he checked it, he heard the warning IR had set it here, and the translation followed at once over the implant. Pilot alert. Atmospheric composition change. New composition, 9,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide, compared to previous 0.03% concentration. This is nearly twice the recommended levels. Computer, print me a respirator. Acknowledged. Printing now. Hardy skimmed the side of the city and came in low to land, aware that the mirror surface that made the shuttle almost invisible in space marked it as a target here on the dusty orange dunes. And here he's gone to um, an abandoned city. Um, he goes into the city here. The filtered air of the respirator hissed in and out of Hardy's mouth as he topped a dune to get a better view of the city. It was definitely an effort to breathe and move about here. Declain was slightly more massive than Earth, so its gravity was greater. That makes sense, even without the great degraded atmosphere. He approached the nearest building, which wore the familiarity of a housing estate blended with the Declaney building style and an air of dilapidation. The street it stood on ended at the dunes, but he saw the mirror hull of the shuttle now reflected in the desert. Ooh. Hardy studied the building more closely. Should I go in? No, it's a recce mission. I need information more than anything else. Yet he was conscious of being watched and instinct told him this building contained the watchers. But who could they be? To Claney? He came to a decision and slipped inside the open door. <sighs> Hardy saw the first floor apartment opposite also had its door open and made a quick tour of it. Curious as to differences between human lifestyles and those of the inhabitants of this godforsaken planet as he had been when he first saw the Zardafi clan ship's cabins. At one end of the large main room was an area which he guessed had been a kitchen. Appliance doors hung open, festooned with, a, with dust and insect-like webs. Another, sorry. Another room resembled a bedroom with pull-down beds and a linen store. He opened it and a foot long many legged creature fell out, startling him. I think that was a hint that I should leave. Everything looks abandoned, in a hurry. He stepped out of the apartment, wondering if he should investigate upstairs. He was sure the watcher or watchers were based there. He could almost feel them. But if they're hostile, I wouldn't gain information and might find myself unable to report back. In the end, he left the building and headed back to the shuttle. There was still the industrial plant and compound to check out. And this is on the Bacal. The announcement came as IR and Mill reached the corridor leading back to the control room from the mess. The sound was so loud that it carried to them. Zardothi ship, 
prepare to be boarded. I met Mill's eyes. That's a T.I. voice. Mill looked scared anyway. What's going to happen to us, he asked. At a guess, I'd say we're going to get a closer look at the claim than we wanted, and perhaps a more permanent one. He crossed to the nearest the intercom. Are we surrounded, Devan? Yes, I'm guessing they detected our position from the tra trajectory of Hardy's shuttle. You'd better come back quickly. I ran back down the corridor, Mill following. In the control room, the sim tank view had been replaced with a direct video link to the control room of a Kiai manned crawler. Prepare to be boarded, Bakel, the Kiai commander barked. Cease all communications and maneuvers immediately. Whatever your mission was here, you failed. I acknowledged that with a shrug and a deep sigh. He turned back to Devan as he slid to the translator catch to the off position. I'm supposed to be all knowing, he said. I'm clan leader right now and I've got us into a right old mess. And what's going to happen to Hardy? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, now, I'd like to say many thanks to our lovely authors and readers. That's Mike, uh, Sharon and Carol, and hopefully Richie another time, for joining Colin and myself. Mm. And thank you so much to our lovely friends and family, studio audience, uh, for joining us and supporting our readers today. If you'd like to stay and join in our chat with the authors after we finish, you are most welcome to join us. Okay, authors, please don't forget to include, <laughs> please don't forget to include links to your books on Kindle, etc., in the chat or send them to me afterwards and I will post them on my timeline, in the finger on the pulse, and on my YouTube channel, Helen Claire Gould, and also on my website, www.zarduth.com. Do include prices, where to get them, and your websites as well. This has been Helen Claire Gould comparing Fiction Fix Online and bringing new and established writers in various fiction genres to your attention. Thank you so much for joining us. And, do, um, and the next Fiction Fix online is Sunday the 4th of July at 4 p.m. till just after 5 p.m. And I look forward to catching up with you then. I also hope to bring Poetry uh, Sandwich back in July or August, depending on how quickly I become able to stand up for half an hour. <laughs> um, watch out for the poster and do try to join me. Bye for now. <laughs> bye bye all. Oh, Bye. 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 Bye.